My name is Christopher Hall. I'm a senior legal advisor of the International Justice Project at Amnesty International here in London. One of the um, weaknesses of the Committee Against Torture scrutiny of uh, state reports, apart from the question of the definition of torture, has been that it hasn't really done a very good consistent job of scrutinizing how the states' parties implement the other um, obligations under the convention. I was wondering w whether you see any possibility that you could be working with the committee to develop a more effective uh, scrutiny, either through your own mandate or uh, in cooperation with the committee, to ensure that all of the other obligations are consistently um, implemented. Thank you very much indeed. Come on the left. And that was a model question because the speaker identified himself and was brief. So if everyone else could follow that, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Uh, Richard Norton Taylor, The Guardian newspaper. You mentioned the control principle. Well, I think this government here, as you know, is trying to embrace that absolute secrecy in a new <coughs> bill called the Security and Justice Bill. Do you have a locus in making representations, uh, the British government or any other government for that matter, which is uh, uh, aiming to stop any uh, information, including possibly information relating to torture, from being disclosed? And secondly, can I ask also if you have a role in um, investigating those who are aiding and abetting extraordinary rendition, which you also mentioned. I'm thinking of the recent Libyan example. Thank you. Here, yeah, please. John Tessulis, Faculty of Laws, University College London. I want to ask you about the relationship between the morality and the law about torture. You began by saying that there's a growing skepticism about the absolute nature of the prohibition on torture. And you can imagine people coming up with examples saying, well, under these extreme circumstances, it might be permissible to torture someone. It would still be a wrong, but this wrong would be permissible in light of the benefit of doing so, saving thousands, millions of others. I wonder whether you think it's worth drawing a distinction between morality and law here. The, the moral case might not be absolute. We might be able to imagine extreme circumstances in which torture might be permissible, although still wrong. But that's a different question from whether there should be a legal, absolute legal prohibition, that there might be still good moral reasons for making the legal prohibition absolute because of the special role that law plays, institutional role, the sort of effect it has on motivation. And that might be one way of responding towards this, responding to this skepticism. Thank you. Professor Mendez. Those are excellent questions, and I appreciate uh, uh, them. Uh, <clears throat> With respect to Christopher Hall's question, uh, uh, we try as much as we can to coordinate with the, uh, the Committee Against Torture, which as you know is the implementing organ of the Convention, uh, and with the Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture, which is the uh, organ of the optional protocol and that concentrates on prevention, particularly through prison visits. Uh, but uh, talking about coordination and actually coordinating uh, are two different things. Uh, by a, for a variety of reasons, it's not uh, all that easy. Nevertheless, uh, we share information. We, uh, uh, I find uh, you know, general comments by the CAT, uh, by the committee, and, uh, uh, and even the reports uh, uh, in, in individual cases, very useful when I prepare for missions, for example. Um, uh, obviously, it's a kind of coordination that uh, does not bind each other to, to any partic particular position, uh, but, but it, ha it does happen. It, it happens uh, uh, you know, as much as, 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 as we can make it happen, and uh, it's favored by the fact that uh, you know, the, the, the current chairman of the committee is the dean of my law school, so I have him in the same floor, and I, I can go to him and talk to him. Uh, but more, more uh, institutionally, it's, it's quite uh, complicated. It's, it's hard to do. The, the bureaucracies of the Office of the High Commissioner in Geneva are more or less, uh, you know, not necessarily working uh, uh, with the same people all the time. And so uh, it is harder than, than, than one would imagine. I think, nevertheless, uh, it does happen and, and it's helpful. And I would go beyond... Uh, <coughs> those two organs, but we also try as much as we can to coordinate with regional bodies that deal with the same issues. For example, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has a special rapporteurship on rights of people deprived of liberty, they call it. 
which has done a very good report only very recently. And we've had meetings with them and in Addis Ababa with uh, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights that also has a couple of rapporteurships that have mandates that overlap with mine and with other mandates as well. And th that cooperation is not only about torture. And I think uh, I find it particularly important that without any cooperation, because we didn't know of each other's uh, role, almost at the same time when I wrote my report on uh, solitary confinement, the Committee on Prevention of Torture, which is a European uh, committee that does prison visits for all of the Council of Europe, came out with a, in, in its annual report with a, an urging to the states to reconsider the use of solitary confinement because of the same reasons that I found. Now, that was maybe completely serendipitous. Uh, and since then, we, ha we are trying to coordinate. Uh, uh, again, um, uh, we could do a lot more. Um, and, in, in, and with respect to certain obligations, which I think was uh, what uh, Christopher had in mind, um, I, I actually find uh, general comments by CAD very useful, for example, on this question of uh, not, uh, not allowing statutes of limitations for the investigation on torture, which is you know, kind of, a, if you will, an adventurous position to take, because the convention doesn't say so in so many words, at least. Um, I actually borrow from, uh, the, the, uh, from the positions taken by CAT on that. Uh, I think not in general comment, but in, in, in response to, to periodic country reports by some countries. So. Um, on the, on the question of the control principle and, uh, as used in the UK, I, I am uh, engaged with the United Kingdom government in a variety of cases, but the engagement is confidential at these stages, so I can't say uh, um, what exactly we are, we are talking about. But uh, we have talked about the, uh, the Commission of Inquiry, uh, the, the Gibson Inquiry that was... Uh, uh, I came to London, uh, among other things, to talk to the to the Gibson Commission of Inquiry uh, at an early stage. And the government has explained to me why uh, it has been suspended and when it will be, uh, when if, if, if it happens, it, uh, another Commission of Inquiry will be reinstated. Uh, and uh, in that context, we have talked about the control principle. But I wouldn't be able to say any further what the position of the UK government is on the control principle, nor what I would eventually be able to, uh, to take as my own view on that. I, do, uh, I did want to mention it because it's a, a, an important issue and because it deals with uh, the responsibilities of states for, as you call it, aiding and abetting. I mean, there's a, a variety uh, of situations, especially after 9-11, where the violation on the prohibition of torture uh, finds more than one state uh, party responsible. What exactly are those uh, responsibilities that each of those other contributing uh, states have made should be the subject of serious investigations. And unfortunately, I, I have to say that uh, together with other uh, special rapporteurs, my predecessor instituted a, a, a report on, on detention policy, clandestine detention policies that was widely circulated at the time. And we have tried to follow it up by writing questionnaires and sending them to a variety of states. And uh, unfortunately, the responses have been very disappointing. Uh, some states, including states uh, representing blocks of states, like uh, the Islamic Conference and the uh, African states, uh, have taken the position that we don't even have the uh, mandate to ask about uh, follow-up to that report. Uh, other states individually have said we're still investigating, or other states have said we've investigated and that didn't happen. And quite frankly, uh, I think the, the whole idea of having a serious debate about these things, uh, you know, with focus from Geneva, but engaging the states in serious uh, uh, discussions about what uh, was done and what uh, is being done to to provide redress. Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm sorry to say that it's, it hasn't been as fruitful as I would have wanted it to be. To be. And finally, um, I actually think that the uh, morality and law should not be separated. That uh, you know, if if. Uh, 
there is something that is uh, prohibited by law, but morality recognizes that there should be some exceptions to it, then the law should recognize exceptions as well, and vice versa. I mean, uh, I, I, I do uh, believe that it's very easy, and unfortunately has you know, made big inroads in, in the culture, um, these uh, uh, arguments of the ticking bomb scenario, for example. And, uh, you know, anybody that uh, even spends 10 minutes learning about torture knows that that's not the way things happen. That there's never a ticking bomb scenario where you actually, you know, mistreat somebody and then magically you prevent a bomb from going off. It, does, it doesn't happen and torture doesn't happen that way. And even the logic of the argument is, is faulty because since you don't know who is the one that has the information, then you have to torture 100 or 200 people and maybe an 199 of them will be innocent and won't be able to give you the information. And the one that maybe has the information won't give it to you because he's a seasoned uh, terrorist and knows how to withstand torture. So I think that in terms of the relationship between morality and legality, that was very ably uh, addressed, I think, by the Supreme Court of Israel in the 1999 case, in which uh, it addressed that and said, well, even if the ticking bomb scenario would allow for some kind of mitigation of punishment or even for some defense that has, to, first you accept the principle that the action was illegal and criminal. And then you look at uh, potentially mitigating circumstances. I think all legal orders in the world would, uh, would allow for that kind of thing. And I think it's perfectly legitimate to do that because maybe in good faith this person thought he was committing a crime serving a higher good. And then we'll see. But you have to see it in a case-by-case -case basis. The Supreme Court of Israel said that even if that were to happen in an individual case, it could not justify a policy of administrative torture. And I think that that basically should have disposed of the, of the question. Unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, this ticking bomb scenario, I used to hear the argument when I was in Argentina in the 1970s. And we hear it all over again. And it, it, it seems never to go away. We have another three questions, please. Start here, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My name is William Crawley, a member of Chatham House. I want to ask, I wonder if is it possible to have any kind of equivalence or balance in an assessment of violations of human rights between state actors and non-state actors? And when you get a report like the, that of the, the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission in Sri Lanka recently, uh, they clearly condemn the Tamil Tigers as well as the Sri Lankan government for a whole range of violations of human rights, including torture. And yet uh, the responsibility of the government is, is clearly uh, of a different nature to that of a non-state actor. But I wonder if UN organizations are considering it as a moral principle whether it's possible to make any kind of equivalence between the two or balance of judgment or condemnation. Thank you. The lady behind. Uh, Sabine Saliba from the Chad Rights International Network. Uh, I was wondering to what extent does your mandate uh, covers, uh, co would cover forms of sentencing uh, and what kind of what more protection would children have uh, in that? Because we have investigated more than f the legality of inhuman sentences in uh, more than 50 countries, and children, <coughs> children can be sentenced still to life, uh, death, or corporal punishment. Thank you. Thank you. And here, please. Uh, Nicole Pichet from the Parliamentary Human Rights Group, and I'm asking on behalf of our chair and Clued MP, who can't be here at the moment. Um, I was wondering whether you could share any discussions you've had with the US authorities on the case of Bradley Manning, and if you're not able to share those discussions, whether you could make any comments on the case, and more generally, whether you have uh, been or will be involved in any way in any related judicial proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. So those are three, right? Um, I apologize in advance if I didn't quite hear or understand uh, the, the first question particularly. Um, uh, would you care, uh, I'm sorry, do you, do you mind if I answer the first two, uh, the other two and then come back to you? Because I'm, I'm not sure that I understood. Um, 
with respect to sentencing, um, well, we obviously uh, uh, have a mandate to involve ourselves in sentencing, for example, where there's any kind of um, uh, physical corporate, corporal punishment, because uh, corporal punishment uh, uh, falls squarely with, with, within the, the prohibition of torture or cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. And, uh, and international law is very clear on that. Even in uh, you know, early cases in the European court about birching and, 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 and a school discipline kind of uh, corporal punishment. So those are clearly within my mandate. With the, 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 the difficulty with the death penalty particularly is that uh, the Convention Against Torture and the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political uh, Rights do uh, distinguish uh, pain and suffering that is part of a regularly imposed uh, penalty. Uh, so we have to um, take, uh, either take it case by case and say, uh, you know, in addition to the death penalty here, there's been uh, other forms of, of suffering, for example, death row phenomenon. Uh, or, uh, or take the mode of the execution of the penalty uh, as an example. And I, I would, I, I, uh, we are taking the position that uh, already relatively well-established policy of the international community is that stoning, for example, or uh, hanging, uh, or beheading uh, are cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, even as forms of execution of, the, of capital punishment. Now, there's a little more ambiguity with respect to lethal in injection and, uh, and, and shooting and firing squads, but uh, uh, we, we are trying to, 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 to explore and, 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 and get the international community to explore if there is such thing as a painless form of, exec of executing the death penalty. That on the one hand, and the other side is, uh, is it possible to have uh, death penalty administered without some form of the death row phenomenon, which is in itself uh, uh, cruel, inhuman, and degrading. And, um, and that's where, you know, we're at the edges of, of the mandate, but we're pushing the envelope because I think it's a, uh, a correct way of contributing to what uh, seems to be a very clear trend towards the abolition of the death penalty. I should say that my report will coincide with a, a, a separate, but uh, a report also on the death penalty by the special rapporteur on summary executions and, and extrajudicial executions. And uh, hopefully, uh, because we're uh, presenting them uh, within a, couple, a day of each other, uh, uh, we'll probably, we hope to have some effect on, 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 uh, on this trend uh, towards abolition. Um, <clears throat> in terms of other sentencing that the uh, 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 you know, uh, I'm following with some interest, I have to say that I have not really taken action yet, on questions of, for example, life terms for juveniles. Uh, in many countries, including my own, fortunately, uh, recently, uh, the Supreme Court has outlawed it as unconstitutional, as life, life terms for juveniles, no matter what the crime. Uh, and the argument is that it's cruel, inhuman, and degrading, uh, among other things. There's other arguments as well. Uh, to what point I can you know, consider that uh, part of the mandate is something that's kind of uh, going on right now, so I wouldn't be able to say much more, but, but I'm, I'm interested in it. With respect to Bradley Manning, my uh, views on the case uh, have been published, so the case is no longer confidential, and I'm free to, to discuss it. Uh, essentially, what happened is that he was held in solitary confinement, you know, whatever else, whatever name the marine authorities gave it. They didn't call it solitary confinement, but effectively, eff uh, effectively uh, 23 hours a day by himself and one hour of exercise also by himself for about eight months. And we inquired as to what the justification for it was. The government generally took the position that it was for prevention of harm watch, they called it. They didn't uh, discuss any further because of privacy concerns. Uh, they claimed it was not suicide watch, it was privacy uh, prevention of harm watch. And they didn't uh, uh, give any, any further explanation. I tried to interview uh, Bradley Manning to, to see you know, what his story was. 
The Pentagon authorized my visit, but not on conditions that they would ensure, uh, uh, guarantee uh, privacy of communications, which of course under the rules that the United Nations has, uh, has given me, I can't accept. I, I nevertheless told uh, Bradley Manning's lawyer that if he was still interested in seeing me under those conditions, I would make an exception, but he declined. He didn't want to, he did, he, he did not want to waive his right to a private uh, uh, confidential meeting with me. I, I, around that time, he was moved, as you know, to Fort Leavenworth, and there he has no longer been in uh, solitary confinement. Uh, after uh, my report was published, his lawyer contacted me again and offered me as a witness in a certain part of the trial that is beginning now against him. And the court martial that is, uh, that is uh, trying him uh, refused. And that's where it stands. I don't, you know, I, uh, uh, I told the lawyer, look, you know, my, if, all I can talk about is his solitary confinement. I don't, I can't, my mandate doesn't extend to whether he should even be prosecuted or not. That's something that I have no opinion on. Uh, and what I can say about solitary confinement is in that report. So you can, you can use it any way you can. You, I don't have to be there for it. So I think that's where it stands right now. Um, Obviously, as the case progresses, there's more and more calls on, on me to take action on it. But uh, I've basically done all I can, quite frankly. Do you want to take the point about non-state actors, or do you want the question again? Um, well, that, uh, that question was about non-state actors, yeah. was it? Would you like it again? Yes, please, because yeah. I didn't Could know. we have a quick recap, please? Yes, I'm the drift of Sorry, is, could you use the microphone behind Sorry. you? Thank you. Uh, I suppose the drift of my question is really, is, I mean, you have huge moral authority in your office and the United Nations in general brings the whole moral authority and legal authority of the international community to bear on governments for violations of, of human rights. Um, when uh, either government organizations or non-government organizations or international organizations of other kinds look at the, the ways in which non-state organizations themselves violate human rights uh, with, uh, with total impunity. Um, my, my question is, how far does the UN, or can the UN machinery, take that into account in, in yeah. producing a sort of balance of Thank uh, you. No, I I'm Thank really you. sorry that I... Uh, it's a very clear question. So I'm sorry I didn't get it the first time. Um, I think that the Convention Against Torture defines torture as something committed by a state agent. Um, uh, paramilitary groups and you know, uh, you know uh, groups doing the dirty work of governments are easily you know considered state agents anyway. But um, in my in my mind, uh, the, the 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 mandate includes all uh, potential contributors to mistreatment. And uh, uh, if you cannot find state agency, uh, that doesn't mean that the inquiry stops there or that we ignore. Uh, the, the atrocities that may be committed by uh, uh, non-state agents. Uh, I would say that in the case of uh, insurgent groups, um, I, 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 I would deal with those cases uh, uh, but, at, at, but applying the laws of war that, uh, that, uh, that clearly prohibit uh, mistreatment anyway, uh, uh, prohibit outrages against the personal dignity of any det detainee. And so uh, I would... Uh, I, uh, uh, I would, like the rest of the international human rights community has long ago uh, applied the, the Geneva Conventions to the, to, to, to the behavior of, of, of non-state agents, I mean of, of, uh, of insurgent groups. I think the, the, the gray areas that are constantly being brought to my attention uh, are, for example, uh, organized crime organizations, like in the north of Mexico, where they commit incredibly brutal attacks on the civilian population, but they don't have the purpose of obtaining power uh, in, uh, in, in Mexico. And I would say the other uh, aspect of it is the possibility that uh, corporations, business corporations, may be complicit in uh, acts of torture or other atrocities committed either by non-state agents or by state agents. Um, my, my view is that, uh, you know, we have, uh, the, the, uh, 
each country and, and the international community has to offer remedies to, to victims of torture. And uh, the remedies, uh, in some circumstances, are uh, not meaningful if they leave out uh, uh, some important actors that were particularly uh, influential in making, uh, in, in making torture happen in that particular case. And, and uh, therefore, for example, in the <coughs> cases going on before the Supreme Court of the United States now, uh, Coyville versus uh, Royal Dutch Shell and Muhammad uh, uh, versus uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, I uh, intervened as, uh, as amicus curiae, urging uh, uh, the ability of the laws of the United States on, on, on civil damages for torts committed outside of the United States to be left as wide open as possible to include the possibility in obviously in the appropriate cases uh, for bringing uh, uh, non-state actors. In one case it was the, the Palestinian Authority and the, and the other one was a, a, a corporation uh, uh, to, to justice and to, to be able to determine whether they had in fact uh, uh, involved themselves uh, criminally, or you know, in, in a tortious way, in uh, uh, in committing atrocities against individuals. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Can I take two very quick questions, please? One here, but if you can make it as brief as possible, please, and then one here. Thank you, um, Juan Mendez. My name is Patrick Timmons. I'm at Post in, for the Foreign Office in Mexico City. I, I've got a couple of questions just about Mexico, and it's one big question. I feel like we're always talking from the hard edges rather than the soft middle, and this applies to Mexico in particular. Um, we know there's an absolute prohibition on torture, but we also know that in Mexico that 92% of the people are there on forced confessions or false confessions, and that 98% of confessions are forced or false. And I'm sorry if this sounds combative, and we know that Mexico signed up to all the constitutional and constitutionalized every single human rights treaty that it's constitutionalized OPCAT, and so my question for you is, what exactly is your role in that type of situation? Thank you very much. Last one here, please. Um, uh, Jonathan Cooper, Data Street Chambers, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Human Dignity Trust. Um, I'm interested in your mandate and the extent to which it can address serious and systemic human rights violations amounting to persecutory harm. And assuming that persecutory harm, which is serious and systemic, falls within your mandate, I wondered whether you would consider doing a report, a thematic report, on uh, the persecution of gay men and lesbians as a result of um, state action and then the actions of non-state actors. Uh, there are reports that there are 175 million people at risk of such persecutory harm across the globe. 10% of those will be persecuted. And whether it would be an appropriate use of your office to do a, a, a thematic report looking at the issues that arise out of such persecution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Juan. Okay. Um, well, I mean, on, on Mexico, I am very well aware of the, the enormity of the, of the, the problem. Uh, uh, my role there uh, is the same as in every other country, to try to uh, entertain you know, cases in which that are brought to my attention where um, you know, they uh, illustrate a pattern and uh, uh, hopefully through them to uh, involve the state in a conversation about what can be done uh, about reducing the incidence of torture and, pro and, and, and enforcing the prohibition. Um, <clears throat> I, have, I am in conversations with the government of Mexico about visiting. Um, uh, they recently invited the, uh, my colleague uh, on summary executions. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it states, uh, you know, cannot invite all of us at the same time, obviously. Uh, but I, I, they, the government does know that I'm interested, and I have a few cases uh, going on. Beyond that, I hope that I can get to the nitty-gritty about what does it take in the procedural law uh, to uh, to um, to establish good safeguards uh, for the prohibition, because I feel, from what I know from the past, from having worked on Latin America for many years, uh, is that. Uh, Mexico has great legal traditions in some areas, but on this one they have uh, uh, really fallen into a practice of uh, this, you know, 
nominal prohibition, uh, what I illustrated uh, at the, uh, in my prepared remarks without mentioning Mexico, this is a clear example. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the courts consider the statement made before the police spontaneous, quote unquote, uh, and unless they, they find evidence uh, to uh, deny its voluntariness, they, they, they accept it anyway. And uh, I think a much better solution would be uh, not to accept them uh, and to make sure that uh, any statements are made to in, in, in a judicial setting, not in a prejudicial one. Um, again, even Mexican lawyers and Mexican authorities are well, well aware of this, and I think uh, they have made some, some, some changes on this as well. But the end result is not what it should be. I, I completely agree with you on that. Uh, beyond that, I, I see my, my job, my role in Mexico as working in, in conjunction with Mexicans, uh, and especially the, the civil society, but also with the Inter-American Commission and Court of Human Rights and with uh, 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 other uh, organs of protection. I mean, uh, it would be uh, you know, impossible for the special rapporteurship to have the only role here. Uh, but I think that's probably true of many other countries around the world. And with respect to uh, perse uh, persecutory harm, as you called it, uh, I am already engaged in some cases in which uh, uh, gay and lesbian inmates have been uh, mistreated, including solitary confinement of gay and lesbians supposedly for their protection. And not only in a criminal or criminal investigation setting, but even in immigration detention. So I'm working on those cases. We're, uh, again, I can't reveal the details because they're, they're still in confidential stages. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, uh, I take the position that if they are subjected to mistreatment, or if they are uh, subjected to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment under any circumstances, the fact that they are uh, they're gay or lesbian uh, or bisexual, uh, you know, not only does not uh, affect my my mandate, but if, in fact, if anything, you know, raises an uh, an additional concern because, by and large, uh, their uh, sexual orientation will be used as an excuse or as a reason for the mistreatment. Now, whether to make it uh, a thematic uh, report, uh, that's a good suggestion. I'll have to take it in under advisement. You know, I have uh, uh, I, uh, you know, decisions on, on what uh, themes to bring up as thematic reports, uh, you know, uh, involve a variety of considerations, including our ability to do serious research about it, our ability to engage uh, experts from around the world, our ability to ask, uh, you know, uh, to engage with states about a serious discussion about what, uh, what should be done. So um, uh, it could, uh, I may decide to, to do something about that. Uh, it has not, until, ta until now, it has not been brought to my attention, but I'll consider it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm conscious of lots of <coughs> questions out there, but the time has also caught us. As I said at the beginning, there will be a reception upstairs immediately. What I'd like you to do is give Pro Professor Mendez the chance to go out first so that he can be there to receive you at the reception. And then there's an opportunity to put questions in formally and have that discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. It's been a very... Uh, sorry, before you do that, it's been a very enlightening discussion. It also demonstrated the complexity of the subject. There's some very difficult legal issues in the middle of all this but also the morality has shone through, partly thanks to that penetrating question, which got a very clear answer about law and morality should be congruent. Rights only exist for as long as people defend them. They're often very hard won, but they run the risk of lapsing because we fail to recognize that they're being abused. It's the same with torture. And if tonight we've served any purpose at all, it's to underline the importance of the issue, why we should all be vigilant against it, and why in the best ordered of states, the ones who purport to stand up for rights, we have to be as vigilant and perhaps even more so. So with those few words, can I ask you to show your appreciation 
Professor Mendes and his presentation, and then we meet upstairs. Thank you.